of the happiest place on earth. So sad, so sad. But at least I'm happy to say that I'm the last fan panel being shown today. So you guys can just listen to me for a bit before you move on to the professionals. So That is true. I am a professional, but not from the show. So I had a bit of trouble with that at Anime Expo a few months ago. People thought I, was wor people thought I worked on the show. Would have loved it, but I don't. So let's play the, uh, while we're waiting for things to get set up, and uh, whenever you guys are ready, just give me a thumbs up. Let's play the Woo Game! Yeah. Woo! So here's how the game works. I say something, and if you like it, you go woo. Okay, <clears throat> let's see here. This is a brony con. Oh, I, I, uh, Luna? <laughs> Wuna. Wuna, Luna, Nightmare, Muna. Okay. Hey, we're good to go, so now I can stop entertaining you and start entertaining you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sound is Magic, a look into the sound design and sound history of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Now, before I get into stuff like diegesis and fidelity, let me tell you a little bit about me. My name is Victor Frost. I'm a radio production major at the Mike Kripp College of Arts, Media, and Communications at California State University, Northridge. On top of being a student, I am also a professional audio engineer and podcaster. I've done work for big organizations like MIT Langer Labs, Putnam Investments, Polycom, but I also do a lot of stuff in the Brony community. I'm the director of voice acting for Gentle Cult's collaborations for their game, My Little Pony Love is Magic. I've done a few covers, and I also run the Asking Metamorphosis Tumblr blog, if anyone here has heard of that, which is bloody unlikely. Okay, so what is sound design? Well, because it is such a broad field, let me start by telling you what we won't be covering. We will not be talking about voice acting. In fact, we won't be talking about recording at all. In most cases, sound design happens after the recording process, while writing the script and in post-production, so before and after. Strictly speaking, it's the process of specifying, acquiring, manipulating, or generating audio samples, and it's used in a variety of fields from TV, film, video games, and theater. So how is this going to work? Well, first I'm going to talk a little history, then we're going to talk about sound effects. We're going to get into fidelity and diegesis. We'll cover music and its effect on narrative. And finally, if there's time, which I highly doubt it, I'll do a little Q&A where you'll be able to ask any questions you might have. So, true to the table of contents, let's kick off with some history. Okay, so as much as we love our cartoons, America did not invent animation. The French did. <laughs> but the first animation with synchronized sound was Paul Terry's Dinner Time, and it is an American cartoon, and it was soon followed up by Disney's Steamboat Willie. And I bring up Disney for, I bring up Disney for a reason. See, all around the world, from Japan to Europe, just about all the cartoons you'll ever see have taken notes from Disney. Why do you think so many people are convinced that Anastasia is a Disney movie? Because it's in, it, echoes, it echoes Disney's style, even though it was produced by Fox. But throughout the animation history, there was another major player. So you guys all know that Friendship is Magic was spearheaded by Lauren Faust, worked on Powerpuff Girls, Foster Imaginary Friends, yada, yada, yada. This is all stuff we know. But... As much as we love Lauren Faust, no one person is an island. Who she brought with her was a slew of animators and writers who have worked on shows with names recognizable to all but perhaps the youngest of us. We're talking Samurai Jack, Dexter's Lab, and of course, the Powerpuff Girls. But of course, this all leads up to one company, Hanna-Barbera. Much of the crew from My Little Pony has a history with this studio. You want to talk cartooning giants? Hanna-Barbera was the biggest. Well, except for Disney and Warner Brothers. And for a while, MGM. Look, the point is that everyone has seen or at least knows of at least one Hanna-Barbera work. Their cartoons are ingrained in our society. Flintstones, Jetsons, Yogi Bear, Scooby-Doo. They're all part of our culture. Hanna-Barbera Studios was around from 1957 to 2001, and in that time, they did a lot. 
But what they did that is probably the most relevant to this lecture right now is also probably the most used, most recognizable, but generally under-recognized things. That is the Hanna-Barbera sound effect library. You might be familiar with these sounds. These are all sounds pulled directly from the Hanna-Barbera library, and if you grew up watching cartoons on Saturday mornings, without a doubt, you've heard of these sounds, or at least variants of them. And why not? Generations of cartoonists grew up watching Hanna-Barbera works, and since the 1960s, other studios have been using their sounds too. Nickelodeon used them, Disney used them, Warner Brothers used them. No wonder we know these sounds so well. These days, though, most studios use digitally recorded variants of these classic sound effects. So why don't we break apart this scene and see what we find. Why are you hanging out in a ditch? Because Pinkie Pie predicted it! Honestly, Spike, she did not. Two coincidences in a row like this may be unlikely, but it's still easier to believe than twitchy tales that predict the future. <gasps> twitchy tail. Thank you, Sans. Well, that's quite odd, isn't it? <laughs> eh. All right, so. So this scene uses variations of three primary effects. The wobble saw, the slide whistle, and stretching rubber. We hear the wobble saw when Twilight wiggles her tail and when AJ rears up. We hear the stretch of rubber when AJ pulls her hat on tighter. And we hear the slide whistle when Twilight pops up from the ditch. These same sounds are heard all throughout the series, and once you start listening for them, you'd be surprised how often they seem to turn up. Now, I told you we'd get into diegesis, and here we are. I kind of have to explain to you now because we really can't go any further unless I do. It's that important. So I want you all to engage your imaginations with me for a moment and pretend that this, all of this, you sitting here, me talking to you, this whole convention is part of a movie. Not a documentary either, though a work of fiction. The words coming out of my mouth, the sounds coming from the speaker system, they're all diegetic. They exist within the context of this fictional world. However, wait for it. If I start giving an inspirational speech and really dramatic music begins playing in the background of the movie, only heard by the viewing audience, that music is diegetic. It exists outside the world of the movie. It serves not to directly impact the narrative, but to enhance the emotional awareness of the narrative drama. Cut that off. <laughs> this is bad, we're, getting, we're so low on time, I have to cut off the dramatic music. So you might ask, why is diegesis so important? Well, it's because sometimes sound effects can dip into the non-diegetic, particularly when the show is trying to communicate a character's internal emotional state. For example, and with some luck with the video, let's take a look at this scene from season one. Thank you all so much for coming. It means so much to Gummy. Would I have some more punch? Well, of course you can have some more punch, Mr. Turner. This is one great party! You really outdone yourself! Why, thank you, Rocky. I'm having a delightful time as well! I'm so glad, Sir Lancelot. My diet's got my own in this little slice of cake! Anything for you, Madame LaFlower. I'm just glad none of them ponies showed up. Oh, they're not so bad. Now, as, as funny as that is, this is a very emotionally charged scene, and it, it's completely complex, with action taking place more so internally than externally. But how do they express this other than making her eyes derp? No. Well, a fiddle draw is used to indicate Pinky's transition from sane to insane during her psychotic break. 
In that same scene, we hear sounds of strings snapping and springs uncoiling that correspond with her very concerning twitches, letting us know that bit by bit, her psyche is coming undone. On a somewhat lighter note, the audience is treated to the song of heavenly chorus when a young rarity discovers a massive cache of rare gems embedded inside of a large rock. I followed you all the way out here for a rock! <laughs> Dumb rock! Of course, non-diegetic sound effects can be used for comedic effect as well. When Twilight adjusts her fake beard after getting the royal canterlot voice from Luna, it makes a creaking sound. In the same episode, we get five non-diegetic sound effects used in relatively quick succession during Luna's voice lessons. How is this? Perfect, lesson over. A little quieter, princess. How is this? Better, right, Fluttershy? <laughs> yes. So what we heard was the zip effect as Fluttershy ran away, a bell when she slammed into the door, a cartoony suction cup and cuckoo birds when she peeled her face off, and some squeaking sounds when she slid down the door. All non-diegetic because none of these sounds would actually make sense in real life. And of course, in episode 17 of season one, apart from the sound of a balloon stretching, we hear the sound of a squeaky toy after Fluttershy brags about being the world champ at shh. Game. A game? It's called shh. What's that? Well, it's a game about who can be quiet the longest. Sound fun? <coughs> I'm the world champ, you know. I bet you can't beat me. <gasps> Although, considering how downright adorable she is, that sound might just be diegetic. So, and see, now you can get that joke. Friendship's Magic utilizes a whole host of diegetic and non-diegetic sound effects to enhance the quality of the show through sound. An important aspect of this upkeep of, of this, yeah. An important aspect of this is the upkeep of fidelity. Now, fidelity is how well a sound we hear matches our expectation of a sound. If you see a cat in a movie, it'd be pretty low fidelity if you heard it bark. But sometimes, messing with fidelity can be done for laughs. Who can forget this line? I don't want to talk about it. Or this scene. <laughs> Dad, what in the world is going on? Why are you stealing slippers? <coughs> hey, get back to the hospital. Comedy through fidelity. Of course, a high level of fidelity is what's expected, and most of the time it's what's delivered. One way they do this is by using sound effects to actualize the fidelity of the dialogue based on the camera's, quote unquote, point of view. They have to do this because sound does not exist intrinsically in animation as it does in film, nor does it behave in the same way. In film, you can capture the ambient background noise and effects the environment has on dialogues and sound effects, but since animated worlds aren't real, these effects must be recreated. For example, take the scene in season one, episode two. Sign me up! Just let me tie this bridge real quick, and then we have a deal. No! Them or us? Rainbow! What's taking so long? Oh no. Rainbow Dash has flown across a gorge to tie the other end of the bridge so her friends can cross safely. We all know this. Because we see it. Twilight Sparkle calls out to her over the expanse asking, Rainbow, what's taking so long? Well, since there's no Equi Gorge in DHX Media Studios, reverb and echo was added to the dialogue to bring to life the sense of distance and terrain between the source of the audio and the camera. Similarly, in episode four of season one, Pinkie Pie's voice was modulated as she was bounced up and down by the shaking ground caused by stampeding cattle. During her line, this makes my voice sound silly. <laughs> Are you crazy? 
Yes. <laughs> there are also ways distortion has been used to indicate a character's state of mind. Diegetically, this has been used by temporarily placing the point of view of the audience within the chosen character. For example, in this scene, we get a better understanding of how exhaustion is affecting Applejack's mental acuity when she's receiving instructions from Pinkie Pie. All right, I'll get the sugar and the eggs. Can you get me some chocolate chips? Uh, uh, what was that? Chocolate chips. Chips. Got it. From our point of view, we hear Pinky very clearly asking Applejack for some chocolate chips to put into a batch of muffin batter. However, after Applejack asks her to repeat what she said, we shift into her point of view where we hear and see something completely different. Pinky's voice is slowed down and hyper distorted, cueing us into just how tired AJ really is. This is the kind of effect a manipulation of audio can have on the show's narrative. It's one thing to say that Applejack is exhausted. It's something else completely different to show us through AJ's unique perspective. Of course, as ever present as in this show as it was in classic television, Sound effects can be also used as sound bridges for incoming scene. A sound bridge is a sound that acts as a bridge between two scenes. Episode 23 of season one gives us some very good examples of these. Let's take a look. We can hear how she earned her cutie mark. Oh, that would be interesting. You know, I wouldn't have gotten my cutie mark if it weren't for her. Rainbow Dash? Really? Oh yes, it all started at summer flight camp. You'd never guess, but when I was little, as a young filly in Canterlot, I always wanted to go to the uh. Summer Sun Celebration, where Princess Celestia raises the sun, and I saw the most amazing, most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Flashbacks like those are very often transitioned into with sound bridges. In that example, Twilight's was brought in with a harp glissando and Fluttershy's with a piano trill. You know, this kind of reminds me of my time at Anime Expo, I mean, the Academy. <laughs> Good times. So obviously sound effects are a big part of the audio landscape of the show, but the music is just as important. One thing you will notice, however, is that it's hardly ever purely diegetic. For the exception of when Pinkie Pie is involved, because let's face it, when Pinkie Pie is involved, diegesis goes <laughs> straight out the window. The only vocalized purely diegetic musical numbers are the Hush Now Lullaby, the Hearts Warming Eve Carol, and Love's in Bloom. But what about all those other songs? Certainly there are songs where the characters are singing and dancing. So what's the deal? Obviously it can't be, be non-diegetic. Well, it turns out that most of the vocalized songs in the series are actually something called ambidiegetic. Ambidiegetic basically means they exist both within and without the narrative of the show. And this is where we take our second trip back in time. See, for most of us, Hollywood is where we had most of our experience with musicals. And it was from the 1930s to the 1960s when musical cinema was really in its golden years. For the longest time, now, now you may remember from earlier that cartoons with synchronized sound first came about around the 1930s. But general cinema with sound, or talkies as they were called, first got their big push only a few years earlier. But why was musical cinema more popular then than it is now? Well, it was a new medium. Before the advent of cinema, the primary form of live action entertainment was going to the theater, where you would see people act. Film was new, and studios just didn't know how to fully utilize this new technology. For the longest time, they would just put the camera in the audience seating of the theater and film stage plays. But once they got more comfortable with cameras, that's when things really started to go up. We got stuff like Singing in the Rain, an American in Paris, and dozens of other great pieces of Hollywood history. Now, before we go on, it's important to understand the qualities of musical cinema, that, of musical music, that sets them uniquely in ambidiegesis. And I think Phineas and Ferb explain it quite well. You know, Ferb, one of the best times we ever had was when we built that roller coaster. We should do it again, but this time as a musical. What do you say? We'll do all the same things, except we're breaking a spontaneous singing and choreography with no discernible music source. Hmm. What assurance would we have that everyone else would also break into song and do the same thing? I don't know. I think they probably will. Fair enough. 
I'm in. So what songs in MLP exemplify this? Well, a few in particular come to mind. From season one, episode 26, the song At the Gala is an homage to Stephen Sondheim's Ever After. And it came to pass, all that seemed wrong was now right. The kingdoms were filled with joy, and all those who deserved to were certain to live a long and happy life. Ever after, ever after, journey over, all is mended, and it's not just for today, but tomorrow, and extended, ever after, ever after, all the curses have been ended, the reverse is wiped away, all is tenderness and laughter, for forever, after, happy all the happy ends and happy ever after. So... While the characters, both the main and the background, are obviously aware of their singing and dancing, there is no discernible music source. From classic cinema, this harkens back to numbers like 16 going on 17 from The Sound of Music, where they too seemed aware of their own musicality and choreography, whilst an invisible orchestra of ninjas lurk nearby for their accompaniment. Rary's dressmaking song from season one, episode 14, unofficially named The Art of the Dress, is an homage to another Sondheim musical number. In this case, it's putting it together from his Broadway musical Sunday in the Park with George. <laughs> In this case, Rarity is the only one aware of the song taking place, for the exception of the bridge, where the other five ponies join in for their respective parts. Again, no discernible music source. Non-diegetic music also serves a key role in the show as mood music. Mood music serves to help indicate settings, characters, emotional states, and even upcoming plot events. Whenever Apple Jack or the Sweet Apple Acres Farm appears on screen, like banjos and guitars are heard to emphasize her countryness. Rarity's Boutique garners light strings and orchestral pieces, and Rainbow Dash performs her ar when, no. and whenever Rainbow Dash performs her aerobatics, you'll be sure to hear heavy rock interludes accompanying her stunts. Of course, whenever there's a chase scene, you'll very hear you'll very likely hear something like this. It's for your own good, Philomena, I promise. Please just relax and try to get some sleep. What's the soup over here? Smells delicious. I made it for Philomena. But she wouldn't need it. Oh, she'll eat it all right. Where are you going? Your own good, Philomena, I promise. Please, just relax and try to get some sleep. What's the soup over here? Smells delicious. I made it for Philomena, but she wouldn't need it. Oh, she'll eat it all right. Note how the music is building the suspense of the scene. Hey, where are you going?
guys will probably recognize things like this from Scooby-Doo. Well, where do you think they got it? Benny Hill, the man. And of course this. If you guys don't watch British comedy, you really should. All right, so. My Little Pony Friendship's magic draws from cartoon sound history like Hanna-Barbera, as well as musical history from Hollywood, musicals, and musicals of traditional theater. They bring it all together to create a soundscape that is reflective of its history and of the industry. Now, this fandom being what it is, whatever it is, I'm sure many of you have heard some of those examples before, particularly if you were at my doing this at Anime Expo, in which case, you're still here? But for those of you that discovered something new about the show, I urge you to go out there and watch some of those old cartoons and musicals, then watch My Little Pony with a more aware pair of ears. If for nothing else but to gain a better appreciation for the amount of work that goes into the show once the mics are put away and the voice actors go home. Thank you. So, uh, at your discretion, Q and A. Okay. So, uh, if you want to do Q and A, if you want to have some questions, line up. I'm not expecting many of you, but hey. Oh, that guy looks excited. <laughs> I don't have a soundboard on me, jeez. <laughs> Actually. Ta -da! Well, not the newspaper, the tablet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, hello. Hey, what's um, up? Hey, um, I had a question. Um, okay. Do you do you work on animations and trying to figure out sound effects for specific uh, videos and stuff like that? Do you? No, I am a, uh, I'm, my audio engineering specialty is uh, restricted to uh, speech, radio, uh, even though in radio we do use a lot of the same techniques as they do in animation for sound effects, I do not do animation, f I do not do sound effects for animation. But uh, it's just, I love sound effects, I love this whole f field, and it's just something I'm really passionate about. Do you ever get um, stuck on any specific kind of sounds that you really want to get perfect? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> anything that has to do with, um, well, either wind speed, because, um, A, it's really hard to record wind uh, without it either coming out terribly or not the way you want it, in, in which case a lot of those times I have to actually synthesize them. But, uh, yeah, that's actually the most difficult thing I've ever had to do, wind. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, uh, what got you interested in this line of work, and uh, how did you like learn it and stuff? Um, well, what got me interested in this line of work was primarily my, uh, okay, so I had a goal, which was to have a radio show where people could call in and ask computer questions, and I could help them out, similar to like Leo Laporte or the click and clack on car talk. Uh, and in order to do that, I had to get a lot of audio editing sort of experience under my belt. So. I started a couple of podcasts that failed miserably, and then I got a call from a friend of mine to edit his podcast, and he's a lot richer than me, so now whenever he wants to do a podcast, I edit it down, and I also do my own podcast, which I get paid to do, thankfully. I don't know why he pay, I don't know why this other guy pays me, but he pays me and I do it. But um, yeah, uh, that's basically what got me into editing. In terms of sound effects, I never really got that into, I really never, really, yeah, I never really appreciated sound effects 
until I became a CTVA student, which is where I learned about diegesis, fidelity, all that stuff, and how it applied to the media I consume on a regular basis. So, so there you go. Sorry, not knowing any of your history of uh, what you have done sound-wise. I'm sorry, uh, could, you, could you repeat that? <laughs> I didn't quite get Certainly, uh, not knowing any of your history of what you have done sound-wise on any production. Um, not, uh, kind of a two-part question. Uh, wh what have you done uh, that we might know, ha uh, know of? And where along the, uh, uh, what timing do you get to do your magic in relation to the timing of the, the production itself? So is it already pre-edited where they're probably not going to do any more edit cuts to the, uh, the, the production itself and you're tossing in yours or does that come a little bit earlier? Do you tie it all down with Simpty or what have you? All right, well, um, so as I said, my, my, my particular field of expertise is radio and podcasts and stuff like that, mostly stuff that deals primarily with spoken word. So uh, for radio stuff, I get this... Here's the thing. Most of the time when an audio engineer does work, they aren't actually in the credits, and it's kind of sad. But um, like I said, I do my two podcasts. I've done one or two things for Radiolab. Uh, most of my high-profile-ish work has been for corporate stuff, uh, Putnam Investments, Polycom, MIT, those kinds of companies, uh, primarily for their internal stuff. Uh, in terms of stuff you guys might know about, uh, Back in May, I did a cult version of the This Day Aria, which for some reason got stupid popular. Uh, I still get comments on it every day. Um, let's see, I, do an, I did the Asking Ask Metamor Ask Metamorphosis Tumblr blog where people submitted questions and I answered by voice with full, with, full on with sound effects and you know, background music and everything, just doing the whole full production thing. Um, but honestly, not knowing what you listen to, I don't know whether or not you've heard of anything I do. So. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so I wanted to know what your sound setup is like. What programs do you use? What equipment you have? Your speakers? Okay. All right, so contrary to about 80 to 90% of the rest of the industry, I do not use Pro Tools. I am the one rebel who refuses to go to Pro Tools and is staunchly stuck on Adobe Audition. I love Adobe Audition. It's what I've always used, and it may just me being thick. It may just be me being stubborn, but it's it's my program du jour. I love it. It's it makes it's every it's so much easier than Pro Tools in my opinion, and has a much fuller set of features. Um, in terms of the equipment I use, my home studio is fairly modest. I use an M I use a uh, M Audio uh, Pro Fire Studio Mobile, uh, which is hooks up via FireWire to my computer. Has two XLR inputs, six uh, phono inputs, and two masters out. Um, uh, for my microphone, I actually had it with me, but I you know kind of wanted to go with this mic since it has this lovely cover on it. It is an SM, it is a Shure SM57. It is a, what is called a dynamic mic, dynamic cardioid mic. Looks like this. Comes with one of these. Uh, and all of my equipment, other than that, I build my own computer. So if you don't count the computer, because if you did, it'd be just even through the roof. Uh, all of my equipment runs me about MSRP $400-ish. But you would probably be able to find it with some discounts or stuff because they come up with new versions and older versions get cheaper. So, thank you. Yep. Shoot. What's up, Victor? <laughs> um, who are your influences? Who are my influences? Um, musically, my influences would be all the old swing and jazz uh, crooners, Frank Sinatra, Ella, Ella, Fitz, Ella Fitzgerald is amazing. Uh, more modern it would probably be Michael Bublé or yeah. Uh, but I'm told I have I'm told that I can sing like a Backstreet Boy, so I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. But uh, that's, do it. 
Yeah, I'm not going to do the singing like a Backstreet Boy. Hallelujah, mi questa notte. That's all I'm going to do for you guys. Um, thanks for entertaining us right here at the Anaheim Convention Center, EQLA 2012. A, that's right, here at Equestria Los Angeles, because we both have radio DJ voices. I like your hat. Thank you. All right, what's up? Um, what would be the most um, interesting or fun work you've done? Most interesting or fun work I've done, um, it's actually, I can honestly say, it's been working with, the, um, working with the major voice actresses in this community. I've had the pleasure of working with Lauren Goodnight, Brie Faith, Meredith Sims, like the entire gambit of, and of course, and of course uh, our wonderful person who without this convention wouldn't have been, Kira Buckland. So it's been fantastic, and I love working with them because if I'm working on a My Little Pony related project, it's just because then we can just geek out. Oh, but right now, though, I am working with uh, Ogataman, who you may know from those wonderful Japanese dubs of the My Little Pony scenes, and she's a, she's a blast to work with. So, but other than that, uh, I have my regular guests on my show, Friday Night Party Line, my crazy Australian friend, Cherba, Nathan, Adam Macross. They're just, most people I've worked with have been pretty awesome. Some haven't, but most of them have. The ones I still work with are. Thanks, dude. You rock. Thanks. Okay. Last. What's hey, up? How's it going? I'm doing pretty good, considering I'm thirsty as all get out. Huh. So, what's up? Considering uh, your audio engineering training, how well does that work with you know music composition and uh, mixing, mastering, that type of thing? Well. Even though, I, even though my work with music has been limited to whatever I do for fun, yeah. I can tell you from my conversations with my musician friends that depending on the genre and how really complicated you want to get with the quality of the music, yeah. um, it can take anywhere from a day to a month. And it really depends on how fancy or how quickly you can achieve your vision because I mean, everything depends on your vision of what you want to end up with and how much work you're willing to put in to get to your vision. And uh, is anything else? Yeah. What's up? That's it. Okay, then. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really, tonight, today, I really appreciate it. Coming up next is uh, where you'll be able to find out about the music of the show for yourselves firsthand from one of the people who works on it. So if you want to find out about that, keep your butts in your seat, and I'm going to wave goodbye. See ya. Their game, My Little Pony Love is Magic. I've done a few covers, and I also run the Asking Metamorphosis Tumblr blog, if anyone here has heard of that, which is bloody unlikely. OK. So what is sound design? Well, because it is such a broad field, let me start by telling you what we won't be covering. We will not be talking about voice acting. In fact, we won't be talking about recording at all. In most cases, sound design happens after the recording process, while writing the script and in post-production, so before and after. Strictly speaking, it's the process of specifying, acquiring, manipulating, or generating audio samples, and it's used in a variety of fields from TV, film, video games, and theater. So how's the day of the happiest place on earth? So sad, so sad. But at least I'm happy to say that I'm the last fan panel being shown today. So you guys can just listen to me for a bit before you move on to the professionals. So That is true. I am a professional, but not from the show. So I had a bit of trouble with that at Anime Expo a few months ago. People thought I, was wor people thought I worked on the show. Would have loved it, but I don't. So let's play the, uh, while we're waiting for things to get set up, and uh, whenever you guys are ready, just give me a thumbs up. Let's play the Woo Game. Woo. So here's how the game works. I say something, and if you like it, you go woo. OK, <clears throat> let's see here. This is a brony con. Oh, I, I, uh, Luna? Woo. Wuna. Wuna, Luna, Nightmare, Muna. 
Okay. Hey, we're good to go, so now I can stop entertaining you and start entertaining you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sound is Magic, a look into the sound design and sound history of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Now, before I get into stuff like diegesis and fidelity, let me tell you a little bit about me. My name is Victor Frost. I'm a radio production major at the Mike Kirk College of Arts, Media, and Communications at California State University, Northridge. On top of being a student, I'm also a professional audio engineer and podcaster. I've done work for big organizations like MIT Langer Labs, Putnam Investments, Polycom, but I also do a lot of stuff in the Brony community. I'm the director of voice acting for Gentle Cult's collaborations for the year of just about all the cartoons you'll ever see have taken notes from Disney. Why do you think so many people are convinced that Anastasia is a Disney movie? Because it's in, it, goes, it echoes Disney's style, even though it was produced by Fox. But throughout the animation history, there was another major player. So you guys all know that Friendship is Magic was spearheaded by Lauren Faust, worked on Powerpuff Girls, Foster Magic and Friends, yada, yada, yada. This is all stuff we know. But as much as we love Lauren Faust, no one person is an island. Who she brought with her was a slew of animators and writers who have worked on shows with names recognizable to all but perhaps the youngest of us. We're talking Samurai Jack, Dexter's Lab, and of course, the Powerpuff Girls. But of course, this all leads up to one company. This is going to work. Well, first I'm going to talk a little history, then we're going to talk about sound effects. We're going to get into fidelity and diegesis. We'll cover music and its effect on narrative. And finally, if there's time, which I highly doubt it, I'll do a little Q&A where you'll be able to ask any questions you might have. So true to the table of contents, let's kick off with some history. OK, so as much as we love our cartoons, America did not invent animation. The French did. But the first animation with synchronized sound was Paul Terry's Dinner Time. And it is an American cartoon. And it was soon followed up by Disney's Steamboat Willie. And I bring up Disney for, I bring up Disney for a reason. <laughs> See, all around the world, from Japan to 